Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back after our summer break to our today's session of Turn on Federalism. My name is Claudia Fackler and I work at the Hans Seidel Foundation in Munich as project coordinator at the Institute for International Cooperation. We are co-organizing this event together with 50 Shades of Federalism. Today's session will focus on German federalism and the federal elections of 2021. Please allow me to say a few words about German federalism, our partners and about today's session before I hand over to our speakers. Our Turn on Federalism seminar is a cooperation between the Hans Seidel Foundation and Fifty Shades of Federalism. The Hans Seidel Foundation is a German political foundation with a mandate of the German federal parliament. Our core task is to promote and support democracy and the rule of law within Germany, especially through civic education in Bavaria, but also through worldwide activities in more than 60 partner countries. The second partner is Fifty Shades of Federalism, which is a website project established in 2017 by Søren Keil and Paul Anderson. Fifty Shades of Federalism publishes short papers on different discussions on federalism. Our online series, Turn on Federalism, today's event is number 10, aims to discuss the Fifty Shades of Federalism papers to engage with experts, politicians and civil society actors around the world in order to look at the possibilities of federalism, its different shades and also its country-based evolutions. The idea is to create a network of cooperation and exchange. For further information, you can also visit our website. Our topic today will focus on the German federalism and the federal elections. We will look at the key characteristics of German federalism and how federalism is used and abused in the federal elections. We will also discuss whether the elections of 2021 are a further sign of slow defederalization of this federal republic. Please allow me to introduce our today's speaker. Our speaker is Professor Roland Sturm, Professor of Political Science at the Friedrich Alexander University in Erlangen, Nuremberg. Our moderator is Thea Bechler. She is a scientific researcher at the Institute of Federalism at the University of Freiburg. If you have any questions or comments, please use the Q&A box, type them in and we will collect your question and pass them on to our speaker. Thank you very much for joining us. I hope you will enjoy today's presentation and without any further delay, please allow me to hand over to Professor Sturm. Hello, I'm glad that you, so many of you are interested in federalism and uh, I'm going to speak about German federalism today. Uh, to make it easier for you, I have uh, written some slides and uh, I will start with showing you the first slide. And what I'm going to say is not only on the slide, it's more than, than there is on the slide but the slide may help you to find your way through my presentation. Okay. I'm going to present you some results uh, and uh, let me start not with what you can read here, but with a more general remark namely that the federal election campaign in Germany, the federal election 2021, uh, produced a kind of paradox with regard to the topic of federalism. I, uh, the, 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 the paradox is, was the following. There was at the same time too little and too much federalism in public debates. Too much because, for example, education policy 
was a prominent theme in the election campaign. Education is, however, a subnational responsibility, a responsibility of the lender, the states in Germany. It is even the core responsibility of the German lender. So it should not have been an issue in a federal election where voters decide who runs the federal government. This was the too much part. Too little attention was paid to federalism, however, for the same reason, if you like, the, the unprincipled intrusion of the federal level into subnational autonomy reflects very well the missing German debate on federal principles and how they should be developed. So there was a lack of debate on the principle of federalism, but an intrusion of the federal level into competences of the states. This observation is typical for today's German federalism. Federalism as such is, as you can read here, a political order that brings self-rule and shared rule together. Self-rule and shared rule both are important. In the German case, there is a tendency to eliminate regional self-rule and to increase the shared rule of the federal and the subnational level. Why is that so? The major reason is the stronger financial power of the federal government that can be used to force the lender into cooperative arrangements, but also a lack of willingness of the population to defend the principles of federalism. Federalism is certainly not a vote-winning issue at German elections. Why? Well, Germany has no strong ethnic, religious, or otherwise territorially defined identities that would fight for self-rule. The justification of German federalism is a democracy argument. Federalism adds vertical power sharing to the horizontal power sharing of the executive, the legislative, and the judiciary. It is not a good sign for German politics if this democracy argument today is no longer prominent in public discourse. On the contrary, you find often political parties and the media tend to treat federalism as an obstacle for efficient government. And it should be the other way around, of course, that federalism strengthens efficient government. From its very beginnings, German federalism was devised as cooperative federalism based on federal state interest intermediation. So the shared element was there from the beginning. The German constitution of 1949 allocates the lion's share of legislative competences to the federal government, often as shared competences with the lender, the states. The lender, the states have most of the competences when it comes to the administration of law, including federal law, and via the second chamber, quasi second chamber, the Bundesrat, the states have a role in passing federal law. The sharing of competences in German federalism is paradigmatic for Germany's democratic culture, which is based on consensus and compromise. This is why shared solutions are so um, prominent. This culture of federalism is reinforced by the experience of close cooperation in political life. It would be wrong to assume that the need to cooperate automatically creates harmony. It means more coordination, which strengthens the political executives on the federal and the land level and weakens parliaments. So the governments on the state level and the federal governments work together, parliaments mostly ratify decisions already made there on this level. Decisions are made by finding, which is not surprising, by so many actors, 60 lender and the federal government. So decisions are made by finding the smallest common denominator. This gives second best solutions a chance to succeed. Politics is slowed down and fresh starts in politics are rare. Political bargaining and informal politics are core elements 
of the realities of German federalism. Most of the time, the result of federal land bargaining processes is a give and take. The lender get financial support and the federal level gets greater access to lender res responsibilities. You can't, can call that defederalization if you like. The principle that the federal level and the land level had their own tax resources, taxes would be very important for supporting independence, this principle that the federal level and the land level, the state level, had their own tax resources was given up. In 1949, all income from that was reserved for the federal level. The lender had exclusive access to the income from income and corporate tax. The local government took the income from local business taxes. In 1966, a joint tax system had come into existence has come into existence in which local government, the lender and the federal level participate. So it's a joint tax system. The reformed constitution institutionalized the sharing of tax income. No self-rule in this respect anymore, but a shared rule. The reform, uh, ever since each the federal level and the lender receive 50% of the corporate tax yield after the share for local government has been deduced, the same rule applies for income tax, 50-50, the federal government and uh, the states. For its share of income tax, local government had to give up its exclusive access to local business taxes. A small amount of local business taxes now goes to the states and the federal level too. Today, the most important source of tax income is VAT. The constitution does not define shares of tax income for VAT, for value added tax. It depends on political bargaining, what the lender get and what remains for the federal level. It turned out in practice that this source of public finance had the potential for financing interest intermediation between the federal and the land level in German federalism. Whenever conflicts arise because the lender are in budgetary difficulties, there is an inclination to increase the lender share of that income, the value added tax income to solve these conflicts. But you see what happens. Uh, the states end up as asking for money and have to give up con uh, competences <coughs> in exchange. The joint tax system was meant to coordinate tax policies at all levels of German federalism. The logic of federalism reform implied the long-term and deepened cooperation between the federal and the land levels and joint, joint decision-making. Joint decision making changed the quality of German federalism. What I mentioned before, it strengthens the principle of shared decision making. Cooperation became more than an occasional partnership in the history of Germany. Cooperation was, over the years, over the decades, hardened into an institutional network, institutionalized network of joint decision making. Cooperative federalism, cooperation developed into interlocking federalism. So this is a systematic kind of cooperation. For the general question, what is the right balance of diversity and unity in German federalism? New answers had to be found because now it meant an evaluation of lender autonomy in the light of interlocking federalism. The states were not opposed to the federalism reforms of the 1960s. The states, in this case, means, of course, the state governments. For them, interlocking federalism implied budgetary stability and the governments even gained political power via the second chamber because they got involved in more legislative activities, federal legislative activities in this way. 
and you see they this development even passed a hurdle the hurdle namely of changing the constitution which is a two-thirds majority the two-thirds majority of the lender uh, supported these reforms with the increase of the number of federal bills which affect land interests a consequence of the federalism of reforms increases the veto power of the lender and their role in federal policy making so when the states get active on the federal level that's not their domain so they get involved in shared policy making on the federal level Interlocking federalism not only had to do with tax policies, it also influenced expenditure policies. The aim of the federalism reforms was to engage both the federal and the lender in the financing of major policy fields. The constitution therefore was amended, for example, by an article of joint tasks of the lender and the federal level. The financing of these tasks, tasks relied on equal financial contributions, 50% of both levels of federalism. Policies which fell under this new rule were, for example, the construction of universities and university hospitals, financial support for economically less successful regions, and the modernization of German agriculture, as well as the protection of German coastlines. The 2006 federalism reform gave the task of constructing universities and university hospitals back to the lender, but in the meantime, uh, this has uh, been turned around by the financial argument that the lender can't, the states can't cope with this task. Important is that decisions on joint tasks, on, on what, ha what is, has to be done according to the constitution, together important is that these decisions were made or are made are still made in planning committees where the federal level and the lender are represented by equal equal numbers this is not problematic problematic is the following you need not only a majority when you decide there but a three-quarter majority more than 50 percent obviously in other words consensus is the rule Interlocking federalism increases the need for unanimi unanimity in German federalism and it created new opaque and inflexible institutions almost unknown to the, uh, to the German voter. Over the years, the cooperation between the lender and the federal level has become ever closer. One reason was the growth of policy fields for which the state took responsibility. The welfare state grew step by step and by the inclusion of new policies, for example, environmental policies. In most cases, this meant that the federal level took the lead. You could always argue that the federal constitution in its article 20, paragraph one, defines the German Federal Republic as a federal state based on social principles, in other words, as a welfare state. In the post-war years, the cooperation of the federal level and the lender concentrated on problems to solve, such as the future of agriculture or economic support for the territories bordering the Iron Curtain, disadvantaged by the part partition of Germany. Cooperation in these days followed the principles of efficiency and financial viability. In the next few decades, the federal level developed an appetite for a more systematic plan to bring Germany forward and together. This implied an improved steering capacity of the central government for more and more policy fields. The additional impetus of German unification 1989 and 1990 and the connected process of institution building led to even more strategic cent centralization. It was also the rationale behind financial transfers and the transfer of administrative and political 
personnel from west to east under the auspices of the federal government. So you see this process, slow process, ongoing process of the welfare state, the, which is interpreted by the federal government that it should take the lead in policy matters. This is against the spirit of the German constitution, which is built on the logic of the principle of subsidiarity. In its article 30, in article 30 of the constitution, the constitution starts from the assumption that the states are responsible for public policies and public administration, with, with the exceptions enumerated in the constitution. This is the theory or the constitutional tradition. In practical politics, the lender no longer dominate German statehood. Now the federal level alone or in cooperation with the lender, shared rule, sits in the driver's seat. This is partly the case because the federal level has taken almost full control of the fields of concurrent legislation. This is legislation that can be seized, taken over by the federal government if there is a need, but it was originally given to the states. As I said, the federal government took over uh, this part of legislation and partly because the federal government has an almost exclusive right to make tax laws. Not only sharing of taxes is important, but also who writes tax laws. And this is the federal government No, no, with some very small, especially the amount with, regarding the amounts of money that, that are involved. Uh, he, there are some exceptions for the local government and also for the states, but uh, the vast uh, share, the, the greatest amount of money uh, is raised by the federal government. It writes tax laws. Germany has a system of joint taxation and no separate so no relevant separate sources for the states of income of their own. And uh, when it comes to expenditure, this is the income policies, when it comes to expenditure policies, the principle of subsidiarity is less important than all German solidarity and equality. Principle of sub subsidiarity would mean that the states do what, uh, where they are best in the position to do that, or are closest to the problems. Uh, this is some, uh, an argument that is not put to the center of politics. More important are the welfare state arguments, solidarity, equality. The sharing of competences and equality is of course the, the opposite of federalism because uh, federalism is about difference and not about equality. The sharing of competences between the lender and the federation in German federalism is characterized by a high level of institutionalized cooperation. As I mentioned, it is obvious that the federal level is the dominant one. The role of the lender is most of the time to administer decisions made by the federal level. This includes the problem that federal legislation guarantees certain entitlements for the citizens which then have to be paid for by local government or the states. The so-called problem of unfunded mandates, which is um, not only a problem in Germany for federalism, but also in other countries. The most disadvantage in this context are local governments. Whereas the lender have a say on federal legislation, the lender governments at least, local government has no voice. The federal land corporation is embedded in the logic of interlocking federalism. As I said, this is an institutionalized corporation which forces all actors to look for consensus. If there are no conflicts, this kind of procrustean decision making may be efficient. Interlocking federalism has, however, the side effects of weakening the innovative powers of federalism, political standstill and increased political costs. It is easy for politicians and bureaucrats who are specialists in certain policy fields to come to a nationwide consensus 
at the expense of the taxpayer. True political efforts to critically reflect on the competences of the Land and the federal level are rare. The German citizenship, this is another important aspect, the German citizenship is not interested in these questions. No one wants to know really how policies come into existence, but they all want to be those who share uh, the results or get uh, something paid for or are, or are uh, on the receiving side of politics. So, as I said, the German citizenship is not interested in questions of federalism. There is no demand for more transparency of competences in German federalism or for this disentanglement of competences. On the contrary, empirical studies have all come to the same result. Germany is a federation without federalists. Her citizens want the federal government to control all policy fields, even those, uh, by the way, which are now European and no longer German, anyhow. Federalism reform has so far only marginally readjusted the federal land balance of competences. So we had some reforms, but it did not really change course. Where German federalism heads is open to question. We find both timid steps, as I just mentioned, for the disentanglement of competences, but also a strong consensus consensus on more interlocking federalism and the centralization of competences. The COVID crisis has even undermined the quasi-monopoly of the states with regard to public administration. The federal government tried to coordinate administrative decisions with the lender governments. When these subnational governments use self-rule and diverge from a unitary strategy, they were attacked by the German press for deviant behavior. This illustrated or, or illustrates the lack of support federalism has. People don't understand that federalism is not the same as uniformity. It can't be. But some German critics think it must be, must be the same everywhere, which is contrary to what federalism guarantees. The undermining of the state autonomy in budgeting has convinced most of the lender that they need federal support to solve their problems. They don't have enough money, so they go to the federal government. This makes them inclined to accept a stronger role of the federal government and parliament in policy making. The result is not only a permanent transfer of decision making power to the federal level but also an overburdening of the central government in the long run, which is not much debated in Germany, by the way. The lender have a tendency not to use their remaining autonomy independently, independently, but to join forces with all the other lenders. So they, if the states have a, see a problem, they, their immediate reaction is not how do I or do we solve the problem? If their first reaction is, to ask what the other states do, and don't we have a possibility to cooperate? They cooperate to come to agreements, and this is called in Germany the third level of German federalism. Uh, the first level um, would be the joint decision making and uh, second the Bundesrat level, the second chamber and the third would be the third uh, would be the voluntary cooperation of the lender. But in in effect as a result, uh, voluntary cooperation adds to uniformity in German federalism. It also strengthens the unitary unitary federalism, a form of federalism which the central government of course prefers anyhow. <clears throat> Let me uh, end with a, another remark on the election of 2021. Uh, federalism certainly had an indirect impact on the 21 federal election. It should be mentioned. 
the male candidates for the chancellery, the conservative Laschet and the social democrat Scholz, both had a regional background. They were heads of regional governments now or in the past. Federalism, in other words, still provides, and this goes also for other, other chancellors or candidates for the chancellorship, uh, federalism still provides a training ground for political talent. Unfortunately, politicians regularly forget about federalism that made them strong once they are in a federal office. Thank you for listening and I am curious what questions may, you may have. Thank you very much, Professor Sturm, for this interesting presentation. Um, I would also like to welcome you um, to the audience. Um, it is a great pleasure for me and also a big honor for me to succeed Anja Richter, who has been doing this job for the past few months. And I know I do have big shoes to fill, but I will do my best to do so. Um, it is now my great pleasure to open the Q&A and I have seen that some of you have already, um, that some of you have already posted some question in the Q&A box. Please continue to do so. I'm very much looking forward to um, asking these questions to Professor Sturm. Um, of course, you may ask questions regarding his presentation and the elections, but of course you may also um, make references and raise issues in respect to your countries or other contexts, contexts that you know. So please feel free to add the questions and um, I would like to very quickly uh, break the ice with the first question regarding um, the last aspect and the first aspect that you mentioned, and that is um, the elections that just took place. You have already mentioned that um, federalism has been an issue in, in, um, in the campaign. You have at the beginning mentioned the campaign paradox and now at the end also have mentioned that federalism does play a role on the federal level. Um, I would like to ask you maybe to the lender level, in addition to the um, elections that we just had on the federal level, the Bundestag, there was also two elections happening on the lender level in Berlin and also in Mecklenburg. Can you quickly explain the importance of the um, parliamentary elections on the, on the lender level? And maybe also quickly explain whether or not you think it is helpful strengthening for the democracy that they took place on the same day or whether or not you think it will be better for the lender elections to take place on a different day or maybe you also think it doesn't actually make a difference well we don't have midterm elections like in the united states uh, we have some people who suggested that you can save money and have all all uh, regional elections at the same time as the federal election that would save money and time and you would not have permanent election campaigns with 16 lender. You always have a, an election somewhere around the corner. Um, both elections have shown that the results of both elections uh, has shown that uh, voters make a difference between the federal election and the regional election. The outcomes were widely different and the reasons were very different and uh, the issues were different. In, in Mecklenburg-Vorpommern and uh, Berlin, where the elections were, these both, uh, these regional elections were. Um, so it's surprising um, that this was so clear, you know. Uh, uh, what it, it helps, of course, uh, to increase turnout if you have uh, regional elections at the same time as federal elections. Now, people are in the, in uh, uh, voting so they, they they vote once more if it works in berlin they were not able to organize the thing but in, in general it works <laughs> and uh, well, once the people are there they vote uh, also for the regional election of course so turnout goes up 
but this did not really uh, change uh, very much. I mean, Berlin, they also had a referendum on um, uh, housing at the same time, uh, which was also very cont much contested. And this would also have probably contributed to higher turnout. But whatever, uh, the uh, problem people thought was that the federal election would overlap uh, regional issues. This was, it used to be the case. I would say it used to be the case in the 60s, 70s, also 1960s, 1970s, in the past century, one has to say these days. Uh, um, but it's no longer the case because we have this great diversity now of coalition arrangements on the state level. I think 14 states have different uh, uh, um, arrangements here, 14 of the 16. So, the, uh, so we really have a, a choice uh, uh, that is regional. So regional elections go or look at regional conditions. Uh, it does not say it's also not sure not not given um, what often happens in US elections that uh, those who come those candidates who come from a certain region get automatically a majority there this has been the case in the past sometimes but this time it hasn't so uh, the candidate uh, for the conservatives for example comes from the biggest German state not from his failure but his party did not get a majority in the state, although he was the candidate of the leading party and uh, candidate for council, chancellorship. Um, there has been another question in this um, regard as well, and that is what kind of um, effect that the elections have on the relationship between the Bundestag and the and the Bundesrat and if whether or not the the politics get easier um, looking at the voter behavior do you have anything to say to that uh, uh, we had a, a three-year project on on the Bundesrat and how it makes decisions and uh, the surprising finding was that territorial interests, the interests of states or lenders still play a, a big role. Uh, and this is independent of uh, federal election results, really. When it comes to issues, uh, the lender, uh, the states always have the priority of what helps us and uh, it's good for us. So it's not a not so much a party political thing as, as many thought for a while, but as you said, we have empirical evidence of a three year project. You read about 50,000 documents and uh, it can, we can show that uh, in general, the importance in the committees of the second chamber, the Bundesrat where decisions are prepared uh, is to follow the land interests. And as I said, it depends, of course, on the issue. Uh, but in general, um, it can't be that much put behind uh, party interests as, as some think. Uh, so party politics may play a role uh, when in some very um, difficult cases where, where there's national prestige uh, to be defended for perhaps. But if, for the routine decision making, it's not, the, not so much important who governs uh, in the, on the federal level. The lender have all their financial problems and they all have their uh, ideas what they can do. And they are, are very much limited, as I have pointed out, in, in independent policy making. So it's, it's always a discussion process and what dominates is informal politics with the federal government. And informal politics is non-ideological by definition. Thank you very much. Um, there is a question from the audience um, with regards to um, the issue that you raised with uh, the, the education competency that theoretically at least still lays on um, the lender level. 
And the question I'm reading it to you is, is there any form of intergovernmental forum to resolve policy issues relating to education at the federal level in case a conflict of interest between federal, state and local governments occurs? Well, you have, of course, uh, a joint committee of the states for educational issues. So that's a third level of government, as I said. But there, uh, the rule is unanimity. So you, every state has a veto in this, in this uh, committee. The committee is older than the Federal Republic, by the way. It was founded in 1948 already. So it's a question, do you accept uh, diplomas, etc., and uh, how do you improve education and all that. But um, the other, other um, problems, there are many, are solved ad hoc uh, when the problem comes up. The federal government and the states look for a solution and mostly it's about money really. The, the states are not very keen on giving up competences in education policies, but uh, if you have a problem with digitalization, who, who pays for it, who pays for school buildings, etc. In theory, they should pay, of course, but they don't have the money. So it's the, the tax uh, reform that would be needed is not around the corner. And there's no chance really uh, to get additional money out of taxes the states would raise because they don't have the tax power. They are not allowed to write taxes, tax laws. So they have to go to the federal government and they go there jointly and uh, try to negotiate. The richer states are in a better position, of course. They can say, we do much more with our resources that we have, whereas the poorer states uh, immediately, so more or less, let's say, well, we, we are uh, for better schools, but of course we don't have the money, so let, let's take the federal government on board. And the federal government is, of course, uh, very willing to get involved in these matters and take the, all these issues uh, that they should not take, really, if they accept uh, what is in the, in the Constitution. And uh, we, we, that may be a result of the, of the coalition negotiations now that we have that uh, uh, one party at least wants that that we rewrite federalism and give the the states a competence in in education yeah? and we have of course a federal education or minister I mean, <laughs> Canada doesn't have one so why, why do we need a federal uh, minister for education? When one land or uh, state prime minister said, we don't have a foreign office, you know, why, why should, <laughs> this is of course a federal uh, competence, so why should the federal government have an education office? Uh, that's not very logical, but that's the case. If I, if I understand you correctly, the federal spirit is lacking not only in the heads of the politicians or the people in the institutions, but also within the heads of the of the of the scholars, the political science scholars and the law scholars, and then also the citizens. And um, there was a question from the audience with regards to the citizens, and one person asked, "Why do the citizens want the federal government to control all policy fields? Why do they not mind that nothing lies?" Um, closer to them and there was in that relation another question also what role do the local autonomies play in this regard could you maybe elaborate a bit on that whether they the citizens want uh, the federal involvement or not we don't know we had of course uh, may uh, had empirical work on that uh, we only asked uh, look at a list of issues and which issue do you think is better dealt with by the federal government, by the regional government, by the local government, or by the European level in this, uh, for this matter. And surprisingly or not, uh, all matters, whether they are in fact 
European at the moment or national or regional uh, were supposed to be the competence of the federal government, which is not true, but this is the perception of the citizenship. And I'm not sure whether anybody thinks about that. That's just how they feel it should be. It, there is this anonymous state that should be responsible. And the state is, is implied the federal state. And nobody really knows, and the politicians do not uh, talk much about it. And uh, our science often um, finds very good words for, for shared policy making. I think that's uh, better than, than autonomy. Uh, but it's not discussed in the open, really. And uh, local government uh, is part of state government. So if the local government needs money, they have to go to their states. Uh, it's a chain reaction, if you like. You know? If local governments uh, are in a difficult situation, financially mostly, uh, they expect their states to help them. And if the states can't do that, they automatically think the federal government might, might help. So we, it's only a, a detour. You always end up with the federal government giving money and they don't do, the federal government doesn't do that for nothing. They want uh, then more influence as a, uh, as a result of that uh, support. Um, there was a question from the audience that I think is relating to your claim that because Germany is not ethnically divided, federalism is not very much, um, but the federal spirit is not very strong, or the need maybe also for, for diversity is not very strong, and therefore there is not much understanding for diversity. Um, the question is, how useful is federalism in, in homogenous states? Maybe you could also explain a little bit on that. Um, yeah, as I said, the reason why uh, federalism was, of course, a reaction to to uh, the Nazi government, which was a unitary state in, uh, at its worst, really. Uh, so everything was done from the center. Uh, in a dictatorship, of course, every dictatorship tends to be a unitary state, of course. Uh, so. It was a reaction to that, but that is history for most of the Germans. This reason that you prevent the dictatorship by having states, by having federalism. But the argument made in the constitution is, uh, as I mentioned, you should uh, give those who are closer to the problems uh, a chance to solve what they can solve and only re re you go to the next step, to the next level of government, once the lower level of government says, we can't cope, yeah? we can't solve the problem. So the next level is, is, is uh, asked to do that, and the next, and the next, up to the European level, more or less. And uh, it's also the democracy argument that you have a certain uh, additional amount of control. You, in theory, you have, of course, uh, the, the usual power uh, sharing or, or, or check and checks and balances of executive, legislative, and and ju judiciary. And in, in additional now, in addition, now you have this um, ch um, check of the territorial level that also reigns in too much power. That was the idea. But if citizens don't see that point, you know, that you want to rein in federal power, you want to control power and, the, and give more, uh, comp more access to political decisions to the citizen, be it local or be it regional, because the regional level is closer to the citizen than the federal level. If, if citizens don't see that, you have a problem. You, know? you, you could, of course, teach that, but. Uh, if you don't live it and you expect the federal government to be uh, the problem solver number one, you always end up with the federal government. It, could it also have something to do with um, a reputation that local government governments are not as effective? Uh, 
Well, if you have no money, you are not very effective anyhow from start. So you should have the, the resources, as I often said now. Uh, and this is the first thing. And our constitution also implies that, that you should give different level of government enough resources to fulfill their, their tasks, really. Um, but it's not that our local government is ex exceptionally corrupt or anything like that. So there is trust in the local government and there is trust in the, in the state governments. It's simply the expectation what they can do or should do is not very developed and it's not uh, that uh, debates in federal par in the federal parliament are very much in the, in the uh, watched or, or the European parliament is the same. You know? uh, who, who knows what the European parliament does? Who knows what a state government uh, parliament does? But if there was more to this, or there were more to decide on the, on the state level, citizens would perhaps be more interested in what happens. But if you, if you do everything together as shared competences, and of course, who sits there? The federal chancellor sits there and, and the heads of government sit there. So it's those on top, more or less. It's not a parliament. So in, in general, you end up with uh, the, the party political logic that the politicians should decide. And the politicians, they come in their... Um, most interesting version as national politicians and not as uh, state or regional politicians, except for regional elections, etc. Mm. There has been another question with regards to this uh, permanent transfer of power to the federal government. And um, this person asks how important it would be to effect she puts us in quotes, corrective measures um, in order to hold the permanent transfer to the federal government um, that contribute to helping the lender again to regain their independence. Um, I think it goes a little bit in a similar direction, but maybe you could say that you, we now have been talking about a lot about um, the financial aspects and the fiscal equivalency. Is there other measures that could be taken in order to stop this development. It's, it's also, uh, as you already mentioned, a mental <laughs> problem. It's it's not that federal that uh, regional governments long for self government. Some of them seem to be quite happy to to have the federal government help them all the time, and uh, there is no great appetite for self rule. There's an appetite of local pol of regional politicians to have a say in federal legislation, which is also not really uh, what uh, federalism is all about. Uh, if they were more interested in what they can do with regard to self-rule, they would of course have, there would of course be much more, diff many more differences between the lender. I mean, at the moment, the differences are, are uh, folkloristic. You know? It's about food, it's about, dress, etc., and this, this kind of things. And they are all very proud that they are different from the others in, in some traditional ways of life or traditions or history or whatever. But when it comes to the question, uh, where do I go to school or how can I, can I um, change schools when I have to go from one state to the other and then I have, I'm not uh, in the same kind of environment, I perhaps I have to take other courses to, to get the same credits, etc. And this is all not uh, very welcome. It, 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 uniformity would be much better. And if in the German debate, when we have a problem, be it COVID, be it whatever, education problems, the solution is always, or terrorism, let's do it together. Let's do it from Berlin, from one, uh, let's do it uniformly. That will solve the problem. It solves, of course, doesn't solve any problem at all as, as France just experienced with COVID, for example. And you have the, the, the yellow uh, vests in, in France that, that uh, demand more autonomy and more regional autonomy. Uh, so they have a nice unitary state. I mean, all those who want that uh, in Germany, they should uh, look at the examples that exist 
of course, if you had a unitary state, we, we, many politicians would lose their jobs. We would save a lot of money. Uh, so I don't understand really the logic. You know, if if we we pay for for parliaments with over one hundred or uh, MPs uh, or members of the local parliaments in many states, in sixteen states, why don't we expect them to do something? <laughs> I mean. <laughs> Uh, if they are not uh, in a, in this this position that they make decisions, why do they exist? So uh, you can't have uh, federalism is not only a way to finance politicians. It, they should do something, and when they, they do something, they have to have some possibility to do for doing something. You have to have, they have to give them money. They should have budgetary rights, and they should have competences and at the moment there are only four left for the states the media the police to some extent not fully uh, education of course is the big thing uh, now I forgot about it for uh, yeah that, that's, that's it right. is the support of uh, small and small and medium no, sized no, enterprises no 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 no, no. Um, um, culture, culture, yeah. culture mm -hmm. is very often forgotten. Yeah. <laughs> but we have a culture a state secretary in Berlin on the federal level. We have a, a state secretary, sometimes a minister for culture in Berlin. What does this person do? He gives money to Berlin because Berlin is the capital and has no money. And has to be representative because it's a capital and gives money to Bonn, which was the former capital and wants uh, money for that position. I've, I've looked at their budget. The most, the money of cul the culture, the, the money, money spent on culture by the federal government goes to 90% to Berlin and Bonn. I mean, I could take that job, it's no problem. Uh, if, I, if that is the only rule that I have to obey, that is very easy. So why should uh, and uh, I mean, have a rich scene of theaters and and and, and museums etc. In, in many places in Germany, this is why we have federalism and why this works. You know, on this level, we have all that. Uh, every state has that uh, rich uh, uh, landscape of cultures. But why do we need federal a federal institution that gives money to Berlin and Bonn? I don't understand that, but that's. Uh, of course, uh, another job that is party politically uh, probably uh, very much secure yeah, for those who, who think that they should also then present prices, etc. Of course, you can invent a price for this or film or that, or that or do it in Berlin and it's very representative. But it's it's uh, not helping the cultures uh, in 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 the states really that really need money. Mm -hmm. I see. You, uh, it was also very uh, clear from your paper and also in the discussion and in your presentation, you are rather critical of uh, in your assessment of the German federalism, or at least in the development where it's going. Can I still ask? What do you think, or is there anything that you think federalizing states, emerging federal states, could learn from Germany, from the institutional side, um, from the constitutional side, probably not with regards to the federal spirit? Yeah, well, once once you're federalizing, I, ho I hope that this, behind this move to federalize is also some idea of federalism, where you want to go, and also the, the idea that diversity is helpful. So this does not have to be imported from Germany. Uh, what, you, what one can learn, if that's the wrong word, right word, um, from, from the German experience is certainly uh, how important bargaining processes are for bringing peace. Huh? And because it's often forgotten that uh, federalism is not only about conflict it's also about consensus and consensus building uh, is the strength if you like of german federalism uh, a permanent process of negotiations informal formal for institutionalized not institutionalized 
So uh, once you have a conflict over the constitution, over where you, you are going, you have different ideas about statehood or, the, or your regional autonomy. So one the federal level wants, uh, doesn't want to give more, the states ask for more, etc. You don't need to wait till there is some militarized or uh, other violent conflict if you are able to negotiate substantial issues and this is this is something uh, perhaps done too much in germany but it is a possibility of course to create peace and stability and this is something that from outside looks good for germany at least outsiders often say germany is is successful politically because it's such a stable country etc uh, and uh, stability is also now the catchword after our election. You know, all the all those who want to create new coalitions talk about stability and uh, consensus building. So that that would be a quality perhaps that could be really uh, help to stabilize federal, federalizing countries. Thank you very much, Professor Sturm. I think these were some really good concluding remarks on, on the state of, of federalism in Germany. And I have an eye on the time and I'm realizing, even though there are still quite a lot of questions that would like to be asked, I think we have to conclude this session here and hopefully take up um, the interesting discussions again in another context in another time. Um, I would like to thank you very much, Professor Sturm, for being here for presenting, for writing the paper, for answering all of these questions, and also for a first-hand interpretation a little bit on the, the election results in Germany. It is great to hear um, from someone directly, um, you know, in the field, if you want. Um, I would like to address uh, you, the audience, our global audience, because this was the first um, episode or the first event again of a series, our next Turn on federalism seminar is going to take place on the 19th of October um, at the same time or at the usual time where we are going to discuss the case of Sri Lanka. So it would be really great if you could join us then and there as well for some interesting discussions and presentations. And um, yeah, it would be great to see you there. Um, I would also like to thank you very much for participating today, for, for asking all of these questions and if you do have any feedback and um, there is no survey at the end for those of you who have attended before but of course we are always very grateful to receive feedback in any case. Um, so I would like to thank you again Professor Sturm for being here today. I would like to thank you audience for participating and uh, depending on where you are I wish you a very good night, a good afternoon or a good morning and see you again soon. Thank you. <laughs>